knowing what you don't know and figuring out that you want to be engaged in that kind of process. And so, you know, what we really try to do is inspire that kid to say, look what you could do if you got into this trade or if you got into this skill or, you know, if you used your brain to do the design and you manufactured this product that nobody's ever thought of before. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whenever you may be listening, and welcome to Latitude, the 43 North podcast. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Kaleida Health, where every day they change lives and make miracles happen. Learn more at kaleidahealth.org. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Nate Benson, Digital Media Manager here at 43 North, and I'm joined by... Hi, Megan. How are you? (laughs) Good. How are you? Megan, tell me uh, who you are and what you do. Um, So I'm Megan McNally. I am the executive director at The Foundry, which is a business incubator and creative space where we have a cool maker space and Mm -hmm. people build cool things. You have uh, my definition of a a good uh, incubator where you get your hands dirty and you smell like sawdust at the end of the end of the day. It's true. I feel like half my meetings I go to, I have like safety glasses on my head and some <laughs> sawdust on my yeah, shoulder a leatherman and, in your pocket yeah. and, you, know, <laughs> you never leave home without it um so let's rewind a little bit uh what is your background and how did you, uh how did the foundry kind of start as an idea and grow into what it is today sure so i actually my background's in environmental policy which has nothing to do with what i do today <laughs> um and then the other side of it so i had an experience in college where I think most people are at in college where they get to the end and they go, why did I do this? Um, And so after I graduated, I ended up um, getting into woodworking, building, carpentry, traveled around the country and started a woodworking studio um, and needed space in Buffalo. So I found the building that is the foundry um, with a coworker of mine. The two of us set it up and suddenly discovered that something that you wouldn't think about but that there's really not that much available manufacturing space in the city of buffalo for startup companies so Mm -hmm. um, you can easily get 2,000 square feet but trying to find 100 200 square feet that you just want to move out of your garage and into a space with other creative people didn't exist at the time Um, and so we basically took the idea and started um, renting out studios finding that you know there's a lot of creative people that want to learn other skills Um, there's dropout rate in the city of Buffalo for mm-hmm. high school students, you know, and really re-engaging people in creative learning process and, and making things. What was it about uh, woodworking that got your, that piqued your interest? When, when did you get an interest into woodworking? Was it when you were a little bit older, younger? Um, so my grandfather actually was a, a woodworker, um, you know, hobbyist woodworker. And he never let any of his daughters or his granddaughters touch tools. It was sort of <laughs> like this, you can't do it thing. Don't touch it. Exactly. Um, and so I really kind of, from the outside, saw that he was really making cool things. Like he'd make puzzles for us and lamps and, and whatnot. Um, but I really didn't get into woodworking until I was in college. And I got accepted to a independent study. So I got... Uh, money to do whatever I want. Um, It was $4,000 to do something. And most people took that money and said, hey, I want to trip around the world. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, I want to buy a house in the city of Buffalo in the foreclosure auction. So I bought a house in the foreclosure auction and started working with my hands. We started teaching workshops about home repairs, just trying to get people more comfortable with rebuilding their houses and refinishing. And, you know, Buffalo houses are really quite a lot of work sometimes Um, and suddenly discovered hey maybe this is something that I was supposed to be doing instead of the environmental policy Um, and so I just started looking up different woodworking studios and I really think um, you know everybody who is a builder has that pivotal moment in their life um, that they built something and they suddenly realize oh my gosh I just built something like I have the creative power and Um, skills to do this and it's really a self booster I think Mm -hmm. in many ways but then you also start seeing it as this opportunity for providing um, your skill sets for other people Um, something that comes really easy to me like maybe building a box or building a coat rack or fixing a bed or things like that where somebody else walks in and feels totally powerless yeah. in, in doing and then having that experience where you can help somebody else and go oh my gosh I just helped somebody else like avoid having to feel that despair moment where they have no idea how to fix something yeah. Yeah. 
and uh, you know that's really why I'm into woodworking. I think it's just a tool to help people. It's it really is such a great tool. I mean, I got into it um, when I got into TV about eight years ago because you know prior to working in TV, like I was as a hobby, I was doing photography and editing because I couldn't get a job. There was no jobs available yet, so then mm-hmm. I stumbled my way into TV, and I was like, well, the last thing I want to do when I get home is sit in front of a computer and edit because I'm doing that all day totally. anyway. So I'm like, I need to do something, get you know, engage my hands and stuff. And similar, you know, case I had, you know, parents and grandparents who I, you know, whose tools I couldn't really use very often. Um, it, but don't touch don't that. Don't touch that tool. <laughs> I'm like, it's a screwdriver, Dad. Like, you can open a paint can with it. It's fine. He's still mad about that, which yeah. is, you know, he holds a grudge. No, um, but you know, back to the rewarding thing. It's it's funny how something so simple, like recently, I just built, you know, two very basic shelves for our living room, and my in laws came in. They're like, "Oh my god, the room's complete now!" I'm like, "It's just pallet wood. Like it's a spare yeah. wood I had left it over." It took me the afternoon. <laughs> it was six <laughs> hours, but okay, yeah. ties the room together. So, you know, the foundry has a lot of programs, um, you know, with students, things like that, but also incubating the businesses and, and giving them a. Uh, you know, some space to, to grow their businesses. Why is it so important? You know, your location's on the east side. Why is it so important um, that you're kind of serving multiple facets of the community? Um, well, so there's a personal reason for that. And then there's also, you know, bigger societal reasons, I think. So on the personal side, um, getting into woodworking as a woman, uh, being one out of a hundred yeah. um, people who are women running a woodworking company, uh, that was a really hard experience for me. And, you know, there really wasn't that much support for me as a woman uh, in woodworking. So um, part of that on the personal side is really trying to make sure that people who are of similar, you know, gender or if, you know, maybe they're being discriminated against in different ways um, based on race or whatever it be, may be, um, don't have to experience that mm-hmm. so that they can be in a supportive community where it doesn't really matter who you are, what you are. It's really what you can do, what you can bring to the table, the skill sets um, that you can provide. So on that level, that's you know why I do yeah. it. Because the unfortunate stereotype is like it's just crafts. If, if a woman does woodworking, and I know totally. there's you know one of the editors for Fine Woodworking is a woman, and there's you know dozens of YouTube channels where women are doing incredible w- skilled woodworking that mm-hmm. I can't even do and you know I'm supposed to be a woodworking male like <laughs> should be able to do it all I'm like if I can get a board jointed correctly it's a good day right um, so it, it's it's just like the tech you know life sciences you know what we deal with here sometimes it, it uh, um, in this type of space you know it's not an easy path if, sure. if you're a woman with a passion right? well and I think you know finding your voice too especially in that situation so I, I'll give you an example of when I had an employee who was a male every single time somebody came in to get work done who did they go to first you know of course it wasn't me and so regardless of that whether or not I felt comfortable as the boss trying to navigate that with um having never ever having to navigate that like as a business owner before you know there's those things that come up where you're like oh people are not judging me on my skills that's really weird yeah. and how do I navigate that so you know on that level that's a lot of what we do is sort of just like making people feel comfortable um, on the bigger societal level you know as you look at just how divided we've become as a country and like even in the city of Buffalo where you just cross Main Street and it's this like clear line yeah. and I don't you know I don't believe that that's right and how do we make people both sides of the spectrum feel really comfortable in a position where it's just about what you can do. It's about the creativity. It's about exciting new things that people are making and being able to just concentrate it around the objects that people are creating just, I think, makes it a lot easier to sort of battle with those other issues Mm -hmm. of like assumptions that people make about each other. But then you can bring to the table, hey, I made this. And then suddenly it doesn't really matter because you made this really cool thing that everybody wants to, you know, talk about and get engaged in. So I think as a society, we need to come together a little bit more and, you know, share a little bit more and participate together. And that's what we do at the Foundry. Um, so talk about some of the programs you guys do there. You know, our immediate connection uh, with the Foundry is, you know, we had you, know, you guys build the awards for the 2017 4 3 North winners, which... The feedback for those was incredible. All the winners loved them, and they, you know, they're going to be on mantles and on desks, awesome. and they're they're really thrilled with just the 
um, diverse material is used and the intricacy of, of everything. Um, and, you know, we, we brought you guys in to do that, but then you guys also partnered with other folks to help build those as well. So mm -hmm. talk about, you know, why partnerships are important and, and what the Foundry has to offer for folks looking to get involved with getting their hands dirty. And Yeah, I, so there's a bunch of programs that people can plug into at the Foundry, and, you know, that um, awards project really was a super unique one in that, um, you know, it really engaged a lot of our business community, it engaged the students that we work with, um, and it really challenged us to do something that we've never really done before, which was, it's always, always awesome. a good, always yeah. a good task, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, we worked with the folks at Rigidized Metals who were so super supportive and, um, Randy Zimmer who was doing the 3d printing. So getting a creative group of people who just can, you know, I basically went to some of them and said, hey, we're thinking of doing this sort of thing that moves and we need something 3D printed and it looks sort of like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having somebody who has that creative skill set who can come back and say, how about this? And they bring you like a, the exact thing that yeah. you're thinking about. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of those different kinds of projects. We've built benches for the Outer Harbor. We do, um, we've built a giant Adirondack chair made out of driftwood. Um, a lot of that is built in collaboration with our student programs. So um, we have um, various ages, but usually it's 12 and up is um, more of those like bigger building projects. Um, just trying to engage with community to do creative projects. And I find that, um, you know, many nonprofit organizations, any organizations around town, even you guys, you know, sometimes it's... Um, Yes, you could get something for X amount of money um, if you paid somebody to do it. But since we have creative students who are just like trying to challenge themselves, learn new skill sets, we're able to do that much more with mm -hmm. it and make something that, you know, instead of a boring Adirondack chair, it's an Adirondack chair that has driftwood yeah. that also has this creative metal, metal sculpture in it. Um, you know, instead of just like a boring trellis, you get a trellis that has like this wacky, funky sculpture yeah. um, application to it. So really, um, I think leaning on our partnerships to do, on the youth side, leaning on our partnerships to do like the creative work and then you know, being able to offer that into the community is um, really something special because you could just have boring things around town or you could have just like a really creative, vibrant, innovative atmosphere that, um, you know, challenges us to do things in a beautiful way instead of just, you know, a boring trash can <laughs> or a boring bike rack or something else. Uh, so how many students do you guys get engaged with uh, on, a, on a regular basis? Um, it varies uh, depending on, you know, the school year. Uh, but so we have after school programs um, Tuesdays and th Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays and in school programs on Thursdays. So um, on average in a year, um, we're working with probably four to five hundred students. Um, a lot of them, not a lot of them, but half of them or so are three quarters are just like one time career exploration kind of thing. So, you know, going back to my college experience is that we don't get enough time to explore what we like to do. Right. Um, and we don't get challenged to think about it and to really reflect. And so, you know, even with the students who visit us one time, who come on a field trip, who see um, different careers like welding, yeah. woodworking, um, making candles, entrepreneurship, you know, as a whole, um, getting that opportunity to just challenge themselves to say, oh, there's other things out there other than doctors or other than lawyers not everybody can be a doctor firemen not be an athlete, like <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and so expo exposing them just that one time can really have an experience where you know a light bulb goes off they suddenly start wanting to pursue something else or maybe it changed their high school career path like they were considering going to one place but mm -hmm. they really wanted to learn welding or they wanted to learn you know, construction trades and it changed their mindset around it or even, you know, plug them into engineering where they weren't formerly interested in that kind of stuff. So, you know, we have those one time students and then we have the longer term students, which are with us, um, you know, usually over a year and they learn everything from manufacturing um, process to design build. We have a giant whiteboard room that we just draw everything up in and, um, the importance of, I think, in the long-term students is really seeing 
most of them come in and they're like, oh, I don't want to do this right. or I don't want to talk about it or why are we sharing our feelings about yeah. what we like to do? Yep. And, you know, just having that tr- uh, transformation over the course of a year and seeing, oh, you know, they're really a lot more open. They're challenging things. They're like looking at the world in a different way. Um, you know, we have a lot of kids who come in assuming that their teacher is going to be a woman or a man yep. or a, a teacher is going to be white or a teacher is going to be whatever and trying to plug them into these people are just doing it because they like to do it yeah. and it doesn't matter where they're coming from, whether they're a woman or a man or all these kind of things and challenging their assumptions so that at the end of it, they see, oh, you know, I could be that kind of person. If I'm into it enough, you know, I can challenge myself. I can build my skills. I can get employed in these fields. You know, one of the phrases that have always stuck with me, you know, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And I think a lot of, you know, college uh, students, you know, didn't have that opportunity to just kind of wander around a little bit and explore what, you know, yep. their taste in life might be. And, uh, you know, what I think from then that regard, you know, the options you guys have at the foundry are just absolutely incredible for, you know, up and coming students. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, so from the kind of business side, incubation things, what type of businesses are at the foundry right now? Uh, so we work primarily with product based businesses. Every once in a while, somebody who's like a service-based business sneaks through (laughs) (laughs) every once in a while. Um, But, you know, it's mostly people who are doing small batch construction or small batch manufacturing. Um, There's a guy who makes hockey pucks. We formerly hosted Zandra, who was a pitch Mm -hmm. winner. That's right. uh, For 43 North stuff. And um, so she was in there making beauty products. And, um, you know, we have candle makers, we have woodworkers, we have metal workers, we have a guy who's trying to make um, bicycle frames with CNC routers. Yeah. Um, it's just all about creative um, making and producing and then getting it out there to the market. And selling so really it. those like main street type businesses that are kind of creating their own products, but, you know, can't afford a Elmwood Ave storefront to sure. that has a back room that they can actually make their, their back space. Yeah. In and there. I think, you know, some of them have a lot of online sales. Yeah. Some of them have, you know, local places like the uh, bottle opener guy would go to Premier Gourmet or, you know, somewhere else like that. Um, you know, we're looking sort of at, you start people off at the... I would call it a lifestyle business, right? They're going to hire one, two, five, maybe employees over the course of time. Um, But they're providing for their family. They're providing opportunities for kids to learn, to job shadow with them, to learn, like, maybe I want to get into this field. Um, But there is the potential for major businesses to come through. Um, We're looking at sort of spinning off eventually, you know, not in the short term, but um, doing some other stuff with like product accelerators and like how do you get it from stage A to stage B mm-hmm. to stage Z. Um, and you even saw with the woman this uh, go around with 43 North where she was saying about like how she can't get enough manufacturers to make the yeah. feminine products that she's making. And, you know, what does that mean for Buffalo and how can we assist in that sort of scale? Um, you know, we're obviously not there mm-hmm. right now. Um, But that's stuff that we're considering in the future of like how we would facilitate some of that process. And some of it, too, is even, you know, on the manufacturing side, you hear from a lot of the owners of manufacturing places where they can't even get quality work. But the problem is, you know, now we're having Northland Corridor coming online, which is really exciting. Um, But the problem even with that is knowing what you don't know and figuring out that you want to be engaged in that kind of process. And so, you know, what we really try to do is inspire that kid to say, look what you could do if you got into this trade or if you got into this skill or, you know, if you used your brain to do the design and you manufactured this product that nobody's ever thought of before. And so I think that we're that sort of first stop at somebody realizing like, oh, this is what I... Mm-hmm. really want to do what i find so interesting about everything that's happening in buffalo whether it's the 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 sexy term startup you know you think of like mm-hmm. your facebook's and your google's like you know the techie type of stuff but you know what you guys are doing too is just as important in terms of uh encouraging an entire generation of of people um to just get involved you know and not be kind of passive and just you know live you know go to work and come home go to work and not just get involved in your community and i think you know, everybody kind of doing uh, programs along the, that same vein, like 10, 15 years from now, is it, 
we're all going to really see the results from that. We're going to have a, a better skilled workforce. We're going to have big ideas coming out of, you know, the east side, north side, west so. side, you know. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, so what's, how, how can people get involved? You know, I know you guys offer classes, right, for woodworking, metalworking, mm-hmm. all that type of thing too, correct? Yeah. So, yeah, number one, take a class. So part of that goes to supporting our small businesses. Everybody we, um, not everybody, but a lot of the instructors are small businesses that we're working with. Um, so it's their income stream, but all of the proceeds from that go to supporting and subsidizing some of our youth programs. So, you know, we don't charge for youth programs. It's all, all free enrollment um, through our partner organizations. But um, you know, if you're taking a class, it's really going to support that. Plus, you're making awesome things. Mm-hmm. So there's some stuff coming up in the in the line where we're considering um, like tools and tequila or something like that. Obviously, safety first. <laughs> we're gonna do the project first yeah. and then do a tequila yeah, tasting you or you know something like that. So um, you know, there's a lot of fun to be had in that kind of realm. But um, on the other side is we always need more instructors. We need more um, brains around how to really effectively run business incubation. And um, we always need money. <laughs> I mean, we are a nonprofit organization, so um, that's uh, always something that we need. But uh, last but not least, I would say... You know, there's a lot of people out there that have super cool tools. Um, So we have a tool fest every year where we do a fundraiser. It's um, December 1st, but we try to get the coolest tools in town. Um, So this past year, we got CNC routers. This year, National Grid sponsored a 3D printer um, that's, you know, a dual uh, printer. Uh, But, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the best ways to do it. Volunteering. And volunteering. <laughs> uh, so if, if people want to get involved, volunteer, donate, what's the best way to uh, get in t- contact with the Foundry? Um, the best way would be to email info at thefoundrybuffalo.org, um, or you can give us a call, but we're usually, we're bad at phone calls. <laughs> we're better at text or, or email. It's just a text or an email. <laughs> Use emoji. It's fine. I'm a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, hopping on the podcast this week. Uh, again, visit the Foundry's website. Uh, or info at foundry.org and uh, you can volunteer and get involved. I think it's a great uh, organization and Megan, thanks, uh, thanks for everything. Yeah, thanks for having me. Talk to you soon.